the next we move on to is Onkar. And as part of this course, I also want to make sure that we're going to look at pronunciation. We're also going to try and look at the history of certain words. Where do they come from? Why do we interpret them the way that we do interpret them? Where's the, the origin of these? So, ik, onkar. If you look at this, this doesn't actually spell the word onkar. The letters aren't written out. So how do we know that this symbol actually should be pronounced onkar? Why does, why does everyone call it onkar? Because it's literally just one letter. Why isn't it ik o? Because that's how it's written. So how do we know that it's called onkar? Bhai Gurdas ji, at the beginning of var number 39, he talks about the Mool Mantar. And there he uses these words. Ekankar ekang likh ura onkar likhaya. So, Bhai Gurdas ji is saying, with the ik, it represents ekankar and ura onkar likhaya. So, ik represents ekankar and the ura represents oankar. So, interestingly, Bhai Gurdas ji is actually bringing two different concepts here, ekankar and oankar. You might have come across ekankar in Bani, and you probably would have translated it as saying ekankar just is another way of saying ekankar. But Bhai Gurdas ji is saying this symbol means ekankar oankar. That's what Bhai Gurdas ji is saying. So then the question is, well, what's the difference between the two? What's ekankar and what's oankar? In Guru Granth Sahib Ji on Ang 838, there's a Shabad by Guru Nanak Dev Ji in Balawal, Rag Balawal, Balawal Mahla Pehla. Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, Ekam Ekankar Nirala. Bhai Gurudas Ji talks about Ekankar. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is giving the definition, what is Ekankar? It says, Ekam Ekankar Nirala. The one, the ekankar, is nirala, is unique. Amar ajoni jat na jala. This oneness is unique. It's amar, undying. Mar means to die. Amar means undying. Ajoni, unborn. Jat na jala. It has no caste and no entrapments, no entanglements. It's talking about this ekankar. Agam agochar roop na rekhya. It is agam. It's unreachable. It's too big. Agochar is unfathomable. You can't fully comprehend it. Incomprehensible. Roop na rekhya. So this is the key words here. It has no form. It has no features. Ekankar is unique, it's expansive, it has no form and no features. Kojat kojat ghat ghat dekhya. Searching and searching, I found it in each and every heart. So that's the definition of ekankar. So ik, when we look at this symbol, the ik actually talks about ekankar and ik is formless. You might call it nirgun, without any attributes to it. And the one, the oneness, the ik, is found within the self. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, Kojat the Kojat the Kata Kata Dekhya. Within myself I found it, and I found it in every other heart. So exactly what we've been talking about so far in the first session. Ik is completely everywhere, but it has no form, but it exists everywhere. Guru Nanak Dev Ji also explains in Ramkali, there's, there's a Shabad 
in Ramkali Mahalapala, Ang 929. It's a Shabbat called Onkar. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji describes what is Onkar. Some people refer to this as Dakhani Onkar. Maybe you've heard of the Shabbat. But actually the word Dakhani Onkar isn't correct. Some people refer to this Shabbat as Dakhani Onkar, whenever you come across that. But Dakhani, Dakhan, means south, south of India. So this is a conversation that Guru Nanak Dev Ji is having, and people say it's Dakhani Onkar because Guru Nanak Dev Ji went to the south. But actually, Dakhani is actually an attribute of Raga Ramkali. It's not, nothing to do with the Shabbat. So it's whenever you hear anybody talking about Dakhani Onkar, it's because the Shabbat is Ramkali Mahala Pahala Dakhani. So it's actually, you have other Shabbats that are also Dakhani. What it's actually saying is the rag has to be sung in the, in the southern style of that rag. But the Shabbat isn't actually called Dakhani Onkar. The Shabbat is called Onkar. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji has a Shabbat called Onkar, explaining in Onkar what, what it means. And in that, Guru Nanak Dev Ji starts by saying what is Ekankar first. Guruji is saying, Prabh nede har dur na jano. God is near. Prabh nede har dur na jano. Don't think of it as far away. Eko srisht sabai. That one echo permeates all of creation. It's everywhere, it's in all of creation. Ekankar avar nahi duja nanak ek samai. There is only oneness, avar nahi duja, there is no other. There is no you and me. So this is what that ik represents. Ekankar, all that there is is one, avar nahi duja, there are no two things. There are no two things in this universe. There is only one universe, there is only one life. There is only one God, and it's everything. Everything that you see is that ekankar. Nanak ek samai. O oh, Nanak, merge into the one. Nanak says, merge into the one. So, we get an understanding of, that reiterates the message that we've been looking at in the first session. Ekankar is within you, it's in everything, Prab nere dur na jano. Don't see it as far away. It's near. It's in you. It's... And all that you see is that oneness. So, where does this ik come from? Is Guru Nanak Dev Ji unique in talking about ik? Was Guru Nanak Dev Ji the first person to mention this ik concept? Well, in reality, all monotheistic religions spread the same message of there is one God. And in India, there were two major religions at the time when Guru Nanak Dev Ji was around, the Hindu Taram and Islam. And Islam was already saying that God is one, there is only one God. So all the Islamic scholars and all the Islamic priests were already preaching this message. That's why some people will say, Guru Nanak Dev Ji was heavily influenced by Islam because he's talking about the same thing. Islam says there's one God, Guru Nanak says there's one God. So some people will say Guru Nanak was a Muslim or heavily influenced by Islam. And Islam and all of these other religions have been labeled as monotheistic. Theism is the study of God, the study of spiritual things. Monotheistic means one God. Monotheism. So, the monotheistic way of looking at God is that there is one God, that one God is the creator, and the monotheistic religions have made God anthropomorphic. And what that means is human like. There is one God, and he has God human like characters. He has a human-like personality, human-like characteristics. 
And then you have the other way of thinking, which was Oankar. And Oankar stems from Om. And in the Hindu tradition, Om has been around for thousands of years. And the Hindu Om theory is that there isn't one creator God, but that everything is God. So God is pantheism. Hinduism is referred to as the opposite of monotheism. Monotheism, one God. Pantheism, God is everything. God is everywhere. So God is the same as the universe. God and universe are synonymous. In fact, God cannot exist separate from the universe. It's part and parcel of the same thing. God doesn't have his own individuality, his own singularity. God is not independent from the universe. God and the universe are synonymous. That's pantheism. God is not separate from the creation. What is Guru Nanak Dev Ji doing? Guru Nanak Dev Ji merges both of them together and saying, you're right, there is only one, but you're also right that it's everywhere. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji gives the complete picture of God, saying, don't fight amongst yourselves, saying you're right or you're right, both of you are half right. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji spreads a message that is completely unifying. He spreads the message that the ik that Muslims talk about is actually the same ik that Hinduism is talking about. It's the same thing. This is why Guru Nanak Dev Ji was so widely accepted amongst all Tarams. Because he gives the absolute complete picture and nobody can question and nobody can say you're wrong because he's saying, yeah, no, you're right, God is everywhere. They say, no, you're right, there is only one God. You're both right. So he gives the complete picture. So this way of looking at God is neither monotheism nor pantheism. The closest way that you can describe it is a word called panentheism. Panentheism. Which is that God is one, but is also everywhere. But God is not dependent on the universe. If the universe stopped existing, God would still exist. God is an individual character. It does have its own singularity, its own independence. And how many times in Barney do you read, you created the universe, you're in the universe, but you're also separate from the universe. You also sit back and you enjoy the universe. Barney talks about that. So this is the complete picture that is being introduced in this symbol here. Ik Oankar. Both prevalent traditions of the time merged, but not for the sake of merging religion. Some people say that Guru Nanak Dev Ji borrowed things from Hinduism and borrowed things from Islam. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is fully enlightened. He has no reason to borrow anything from anywhere. He might have used the same terminology to explain to the people of the time he might have used Hindu terminology for the Hindus and Islamic terminology for the Muslims. But that doesn't mean that he's borrowing their concepts. There's no concept that Guru Nanak Dev Ji needs to borrow, but he needs to use language. Remember we talked about the importance of language. He needs to use language that's appropriate to the people. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji isn't just merging two traditions for the sake of merging and picking and choosing. It's not a pick and mix. He just picks and chooses what he likes to create a new religion. Guru Nanak Dev Ji isn't interested in a new religion. He's just interested in giving you the truth and saying, I can't help it, this is the truth. And to you I'll explain it this way and to you I'll explain it that way. Ikkwankar is the complete definition. It's a unifying message rather than a divisive message. Guru Nanak doesn't come and say, you lot are wrong, you lot are wrong, and everybody else who's left Come and follow me, I've got something new. Guru Nanak doesn't claim that he's giving a new line of thought. He's not trying to introduce something new. The such, the truth has always been there. 
He's just reiterating it. And because he's speaking the truth, Guru Nanak himself doesn't claim to hold the monopoly of truth. He doesn't say, everybody that's come before me, they're wrong, and I'm only the truth. He doesn't say that. He's here to give the true message. When Buddha was asked, does God exist? He remained quiet and he picked up a flower. Some people have interpreted that to mean that Buddha very clearly says that there isn't a God. And that's why people who don't know anything about Buddhism, they'll say Buddhism doesn't believe in God. The other half will say Buddha very clearly pointed at the flower to say he is God. Buddhism is absolute such as well. The Buddha was also giving such in his own way. In fact, the such was so much that Buddha could say nothing. What can I say to answer that question, what is God? Who am I that I can answer what is God? So he remained quiet. The fact is that every single religion started with the absolute truth. They may only have been looking at one angle of the truth, but in reality, so is Gurbani. Gurbani admits, Guru Nanak Dev Ji admits, Tera Ant Napaya, I can't reach your end. Your story cannot be told. I cannot reach the final end of you. So we shouldn't think that Sikhi is the complete definition of God. Because Sikhi itself is saying, you cannot be completed. How can everything about you be written? Ape jane ap. Only you know yourself. And the reality is that God isn't any more in Guru Nanak than it is in you. But what isn't in Guru Nanak is I am. Guru Nanak doesn't have an I am. We do. And that's the only difference. Guru Nanak has completely eradicated his entire self-identity. And all the Pagats are the same. Me and God are the same. We are one. Everything that I say is his words. Turki Bani. Everything is his words. What they're really saying is, I am not. I'm not here. I'm not here. When you look at me, don't look at me, look at God. Duality comes from conditioning. You've constantly, we've all been constantly conditioned to think as individuals. Now, I can't answer whether Guru Nanak Dev Ji is born fully enlightened or whether Guru Nanak became enlightened. You have the whole story of him having his enlightenment when he went into the river for three days. Maybe that's the point of his enlightenment. But then was Guru Nanak not enlightened before that? When they were getting to that stage, where were they? But in reality, this isn't the path about Guru Nanak's enlightenment. It's about your enlightenment. That's why Guru Nanak doesn't spend any effort talking about his life the Guru Granth Sahib isn't Guru Nanak Dev Ji's Janam Sakhi. It's not a storybook about Guru Nanak's life. It's Guru Nanak's teachings that, as has happened to me, let me share it with you as well. Because you're just as capable of reaching the same level as Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And that isn't a statement of ego. That's a statement of non-ego. When there is no I am, then all that's left is humility. If there is an I am, then the humility is always slightly false. You can, have, you can have somebody who are genuinely very, very humble people. But if you probe them, you'll find that actually they don't think of themselves at all. Because their mind is so engrossed in serving others that they've lost that, that I am-ness. In fact, they might just say, look, I'm nothing. Just stop, stop talking about me. I'm nothing. Stop referring to me. I'm nothing special. You know, Baba Puran Singh Ji Kri Chawala, he, he used to refer to himself as the Sangata Kukkar. In a letter that I've read from him, he's actually referred to himself as the dog of the Sangat. 
This is where the Brahmgyanis are. He said, I'm nothing. If you want to call me something, call me a dog. And this is dog, not in man's best friend's interpretation of dog, but in India, a dog is just wild and stray and rolling in muck and finding food in garbage. This is how the dog is perceived in India, as a stray, as a wild animal, like a fox we would see in this country, you know, just rummaging amongst garbage. Brahmgyanis are referring to them, themselves as, as a dog. Gurbani saying, Ham kukar tere darbar, I'm a dog in your court. It's not a false humility. It's a humility that comes from genuinely knowing I'm genuinely nothing. When you actually lose the ego and you finally realize all that stuff that I thought was so great about me actually is just nonsense. I'm genuinely nothing. All that is genuinely great is Teri Kirpa, is your grace, is the universe's Kirpa, is, is the universe's greatness. So that humility is a genuine humility that can only come from somebody who's realized I'm actually nothing. Who's got it? I'm really not here. I'm really nothing special. What you see is just rubbish. So that's a real humility. And any humility less than that is a slightly false humility because it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner, nay, 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 to see belly up, no, no. Then you're like, but in reality, they'll walk behind your back and they might insult you. You know, there's humility for show and there's genuine humility. Yep. That it's not your greatness, it's not that you've done something else, but the same also has to apply for the other way around. All your mistakes aren't your mistakes. And that's where it becomes difficult. Are you willing to blame God for all of your mistakes? Because in reality, all that's been doing it is God. All that there is, is you. If you're allowing yourself any room to say that I am the sinner, and I'm the one who's made the mistakes, you're back to I am. When you forget that all that there is is God. But the I am is making the mistake. But the I am should not also take credit for that mistake. If you hold on to that mistake, that's my mistake. I did that one. Then you're allowing an ego that says I made that mistake. They are, but they're holding on to their I ams. In reality, you're still holding on to I ams. You have to be able to let go and say, Maharaj, even that was your hukum. You didn't allow me to know at that point. So you allowed that mistake to happen. Even that's your blessing. All mistakes are his blessing. All mistakes are his doing. To the point at which that there is no you left to surrender. There's nothing left to surrender. That all that there is is you. But easier for us to, in our attempt to really say, but easier for ego to say, that bit I can it's, That's the easy but, bit. It's so easy. Of course it is. But then to say, ego versus self. Because you're holding on to yourself. Because there's a bit of you that still doesn't want to let yourself go. Of course, it's conditioning. Guru Nanak has given you the formula. All that there is, is God. You know what's really difficult to accept? God does good and bad. We can't accept that. We can't accept. Let's look at good and bad to begin with. Let's say it's your wedding day. And you wake up really excited, open the window, and it's absolutely pouring down with rain. What are you going to say? That is really bad. It's been sunny for the last three weeks. Why of all days does it have to happen today? This is my special day. That's a really bad thing. And you're going to apologize to all your guests as well. Oh, it's so bad. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's terrible. Now, a farmer has been looking at the clouds for those same three weeks and saying, why has it not rained? On the day of your wedding day, he doesn't know you, he doesn't know your wedding, but he looks outside and it's pouring it down with rain. What's he going to say? He's going to say, oh, that's really good. 
Now you tell me, is the rain good or is the rain bad? It's neither. It's in the eyes of the beholder. We only label things as good and bad based on how it affects us. And in the same way, is murder good or bad? Or is it just the universe doing what the universe does? When a lion kills a gazelle, is it good or is it bad? When a lion kills an animal, is it good or is it bad? It is what it is, right? Because it doesn't affect you, it's neither good nor bad. The lion, you might think, oh, it's just, oh, he killed a child, oh, he killed a baby deer, oh, no, oh, that's really bad, you feel sad for the deer. But then he goes and he feeds his children. Neither good nor bad. Let's say that the lion comes and kills your child. Is it good or bad? Is it? Is it? Because the alternative is that if he didn't kill that child, he, his children will go hungry. If he doesn't kill something, his children will go bad. Is, it good? is that good or bad? Then it becomes about, actually, it affects me, I am. There's a story of a saint who his son was really ill for a long time and his son passed away and he loved his little boy, absolutely loved his boy to bits and his wife came up to him and said, I thought you'd be really distraught because you loved your son so much and the saint says, at first it shocked me but then I remembered that before he was alive, I knew how to be happy. Before he was born, I knew what happiness was. And then for a short while, he was here, and I was happy. And then I realized that all that's happened is I've gone back to the state that was like before he was born. The circumstances are exactly the same. He was here, I was happy. And now he's not here. I'm back to how I was before he was ever born, and I knew how to be happy then. What's changed? It's just like a dream. He was here for a short while, it was a nice dream while it lasted, and now the dream is over, another dream is here. The mentality of the sadhu is of absolute neutrality to what is happening in the universe around him. And the word that can be used to summarize all of this is hukum. And that's why after explaining the Mool Mantra very quickly onto it, Guru Nanak Dev Ji goes into hukum and the importance of hukum. It simply is what it is. You can apply a label to the rain and say it's good, and you can apply a label to the bad and say to the rain and say it's bad. But in reality, what effect does your label have on the rain? None. If you tell the rain to stop, will it stop? If you call the rain good, will it carry on? Your words and your thoughts are absolutely insignificant to what's actually happening around you. So the question comes, well then why did Guruji save those people? What was the need for the Khalsa to be created so that they could go and defend other people's honor. And the question then that arrives is, well, how do I know whether to do anything? If somebody's being attacked in front of me, I could just stand there and go, why Guru, that's you. It's all you. It's all you. Now, let's give this scenario. If you're one person, absolutely weak, with no ability to do anything, ten people are attacking one person. If you genuinely have no ability to stand up and do anything about it, can you physically do anything? Can you go and save that person? If you genuinely, like, you can't, for whatever reason, you can't even get up and save that person. 
You can't do anything about it. Now, the same scenario, imagine you're like some karate master or something like that. Ten people fighting one person. You look at that situation, you know you can solve that situation. What's the difference? The only difference is your readiness to do something about it. Whether you've been given the tools to protect that person or whether you've not been given the tools to protect that person. Now, you can't control whether you're a kung fu master or not. Right this moment, right now, how many of you are? You can't control that. Somebody might be. So the Khalsa is positioned in such a way that if the situation around me means that there is an ability for me to do something, then it means that there's a reason I'm standing there. If there's something, if one person is beating up another person and I can do something about it, it's not me doing something about it, nor is it my decision to do something about it. It simply means the universe has placed me in a position that the universe has placed a defender there to do something about it. But if the universe places you in that position where you physically can't do anything about it, that's the universe's choice as well. So the Khalsa is not a decision maker that says, I'm going to pick and choose who I'm going to save. The Khalsa is saying, something is happening and there is an opportunity for one part of the universe to save another part of the universe and it just moves in that direction. It completely doesn't get itself involved. There's a Shabad that Guru Gobind Singh Ji writes in the Dasam Granth where he talks about his battles and he talks about a particular enemy on the other side of the field. And Guruji rode up to that enemy in the middle of the battle and with one swoop takes his sword and chops the head of the enemy. And Guruji writes in his Bani, he writes that before my sword touched the enemy's head, his fate had already been sealed. The universe had already decided that this man was going to die today. It simply used my sword to carry out that task. Guruji doesn't bring himself into the equation. He doesn't say, I killed you. He simply says, today was your day to die, and the universe simply used my sword and my hand as the vehicle to carry out that destiny. Where's the I? It's a very high, sophisticated way of thinking that there is no I. If something bad is happening, and the universe is in a position to do something about it, it will do something about it. If the universe has not positioned someone to do something about it, it won't do something about it. Neither event is good or bad. It's that level of detachment that you have to have, that even you protecting someone isn't your good deed. And even you not being able to protect someone isn't your good deed. There is no room for I in the conversation. As soon as you say the word I, you've broken it. You've broken Guru Nanak Dev Ji's mathematical perfection. That I've done something, I can't do something, I can do something. He's doing something good, he's doing something bad, I must do something about it. That's not Tuhi Tuhi. All there is is you, all there is is you. What should your ardas be? What kind of ardas do we do? Give me this, give me that. God, I've got an exam coming up. Give me this. I'll do ten moon mantras. God, I'll give. I'll do an account part. What kind of ardases do we do? Quite selfish ardases. God, I'm trying to buy a house. Please make sure it goes through. It's a, it's a negotiation we do with God. We've treated God as a, as a businessman. God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Me, you, duality. But in reality, your adas should be, let me understand your hukum. Let whatever happen in front of me, and let me accept your hukum. 
Yeah. Yeah. But it also says that you are inside me and you are me. Let's not create this. Look, let's be clear here. Barney uses human uh, terminology to explain it to us. It doesn't mean God is my father and my mother. In fact, it does mean God is my father and mother in a completely different way. That what I am made up of is my father and my mother. In reality, what you're made up of is your father and your mother. We're all made up of the same cells that come from our father and our mother. In fact, what he's saying is, I am my father and I am my mother. I am not me. You are the one that looks after everything. So let's, Guruji uses this terminology just to help you understand. But what happens is because we don't understand the I, every other reference in Gurbani we use from the I. So we apply dualistic thinking to Bani. That's because we've not spent any time trying to understand Ik. If you understood Ik, then the very way that you look at Bani will not be like you are my father and you are my mother. It will be looking at itself and saying you are your own father, you are your own mother. You are your own protector. Tu mera rakha sabni thani. You're right, it is their karam, but the karam is also the universe's karam. Otherwise we can say, well, you've got good karam and you've got bad karam and you're this and you're that. And every part of the universe has its own function. Every part of the universe has its own start date and its own end date. The day it's going to be born, the day it's going to die, it's got its circumstances already mapped out. All we're simply seeing is a play that's already been decided how the outcome is going to be. So all you have to do is sit and watch the play. What does Guru Nanak, what does Guru Gobind Singh Ji call his autobiography? The Bachitar Natak, the beautiful play. He doesn't say it's my story. He calls it the beautiful play. It is the play of the universe. Now, you might say that one character has got good, uh, good karam and the other character has got bad karam and this character kills that character, but they're just characters of the same play. Just sit back and watch. Even applying a label onto it saying that's good karam and that's bad karam, good and bad of what? Who is to decide what is good and bad? Even this whole terminology of good and bad is dualistic. Because you're saying there's two states of being. There's a good way to be and there's a bad way to be. Guru Nanak says, no, there isn't. Let's go back to Ik. All I'm saying is, read Barney first. Let Gurbani be your Rath. When you understand Barney, you'll understand Rath. If you don't understand Barney, you won't understand the rules. And they're not rules. There's no doctrine here. This is for your own benefit. If the Gursiks have got together and said, according to this lifestyle, we recommend this, 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 and this, it's because they're saying, look, there's ways to easily understand this by living your life a certain way. And if you don't do it, it's going to make understanding Barney a lot harder and the spiritual path a lot harder. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not prescriptive like that. It's not, if you don't do this, you will go to heaven, hell and heaven and all that sort of stuff. We're not into all that. Where is heaven and where is hell? Duality. There's a heaven and there's a hell. There's a good and there's a bad. So we talked about the merging of these two symbols. And then we come on to what is Onkar. So if we took the ik away, what exactly is this Onkar? What is this? include. And again, it's really important that we look at the history of some of these words. Unfortunately, where we've got to in Sikhi is today we like to think that everything in Sikhi is absolutely brand new and the Guru's created and invented everything. 
And because we think like that, anything that belongs to any other tradition, we reject it. And so we have this mentality now, because we don't want to read or learn anything about Islam. We don't want to read anything about Hinduism, heaven forbid. We don't want to touch that stuff, because that stuff is infiltrating our panth. But in reality, almost nothing in Gurbani is unique to us. None of the words that come from Gurbani, almost none of them, are unique to the Guru. So even the word O, Oang, is not unique to us. The word Onkar is also not exclusive to Sikhi and was not invented by Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And the way we know this is because in Gurbani, Bhagats have also used the word Onkar. So, for example, Kabir Ji says, Onkar ad me janna, lik ar mete tahe namana. So, Bhagat Kabir Ji says, I only know the one Onkar, the universal primal being, Onkar ad me janna. That's the being that I worship. That's the one that I know. Lik ar mete tahe namana. Any being that can be created and destroyed, I don't accept them. I don't accept any temporary beings. I only accept the Onkar, the Ad, the, the ultimate primal being. So Kabirji is using this. Now somebody can argue, well, Kabirji must have heard the word from Guru Nanak Dev Ji, if they really want to hold on to this concept that Onkar is ours. But it's simply not true. And the reason we know that it's not true is the Hindu symbol, Om. That Hindu symbol produces the sound Om. But the name of this symbol is Onkar. And you can look this up yourself. Go look it up on Wikipedia or something. The name of this symbol is Onkar. And every Tika by any well-respected scholar of Sikhi has said that Onkar is the same as Om. Look at Mahan Kosh. Look at Professor Sahib Singh. Look at any well-respected tikka of Guru Granth Sahib Ji, and they will say that Oankar is Om. But I'm not presenting a new idea here. I'm simply telling you what, what is, what's already out there. The name of this symbol is Oankar. And Oankar is used throughout Hindu scripture. What does Om mean? In order to understand Onkar, we have to know how do the people of the time already use that. The Om symbol represents what in the Hindu tradition is called Trimurti. And Trimurti is in English easily described as Trinity, three. There's no coincidence that the Om symbol is also like the number three. And in Hindi and Punjabi, the number three. Because the Om represents three things. And the three things that it represents are creator, sustainer, destroyer. And now you'll understand when you read your English translations of Ikwankar, God is one. And he is the creator, the sustainer, the destroyer. Where does that come from? That comes from Onkar. That comes from Om. God has three functions. Creator, sustainer, destroyer. That's what Om represents. If anybody's come across the Mahan Kosh, it is written by somebody called Khan Singh Nabha, a scholar of Sikhi, about 1900s, early 1900s. Mahan Kosh. Kosh means dictionary. Mahan means great. It is the definitive dictionary of Guru Granth Sahib Ji where every single word in Guru Granth Sahib Ji has been defined. So if you ever want to know the meaning of a particular word, go look it up in the Mahan Kosh. But it is only in Punjabi at the moment. It's only available in Punjabi. Mahan Kosh. In the Mahan Kosh, Khan Singh Nabaji says, Oang equals Om. He says it's the same thing. That which sustains all, the source of everything, and that which is everything is the same as Om. 
that which sustains all, is everything, and is in everything, is Om. Omkar and Om are the same thing. I'm not saying this to scare anyone. My interest is simply to educate. Whether you take it or you reject it is up to you. But the history of this does derive from things that are older than our, than our tradition. Again, that's nothing to be afraid of. But the thing that's missing in the Trimurti analogy is the Ekamai. That even though the Hindu tradition worship, worships the three, Guru Nanak Dev Ji puts a one in front of it and says, don't forget the one. Don't forget that the three also have one that they're worshipping. And they also come from one. Ekamai. Tin chele. They're nothing more than chele of the one. So why do you worship the chele? Kabir Ji is saying the same thing. Oankar Admejanya. I only know the one and I don't care for any of the demigods. I don't care for them because they can be created and destroyed. And they're also meditating on something. So who do they meditate on? Why don't I just meditate directly? Why have a middleman? This is why Sikhi is simple. No middlemen. Direct route. So the word Oang is what we're talking about here. Oang. Jab Sahib uses this word. Oang ad rupe anad surupe. Oang is the vibration in, the, in its primal form. Oang ad rupe. This Oang is the primal rupe. Remember, Ekankar doesn't have a roop. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying in, in Rag Bilava right at the beginning, Ekankar has no roop. it's Nirala, na roop na rekha. Guru Gobind Singh Ji is saying that Oang is the, the initial form of the universe. So we'll go on to what does that mean. Anad Sarupe, it is beingless form. It is formless form. It is beingless. It's not dependent on the universe. This is where it's, we talk about this panentheism rather than monotheistic or pantheistic. So, Oankar means the vibration of Oang. It's this vibration that's happening around us. And it means the manifestation of this vibration. Oankar means that vibration became manifest. The physical manifestation of the non-physical. Oankar is a physical manifestation of Ekankar, which is the non-physical. Ekankar is non-physical, Oankar is physical. So the world and the universe that you see around you is the physical manifestation of the One. From Ekankar, from nothingness, Oankar emerges. Creation, sound, energy becomes Pargat. From Nirgun to Sargun, from formless, from no quality to quality. That is the de definition in the Mahan Kosh. Ik is the formless, and that created the universe by uttering a sound. And the sound it uttered was Oang. And by uttering the Oang, all of the universe was created. And that sound never stopped. The Oankar is continuing right now. It's continuously being created. That's the definition by Kavi Santok Singh. Kavi Santok Singh has one of the oldest tikas of Japji Sahib, written in 1829. It's called the Garab Ganjini Tika. And there he talks about the formless uttered the sound, and the sound was Oang. So that's Ik Oankar. Who revealed this knowledge to mankind? I think as people became enlightened, enlightenment means that I understand what I didn't understand before. I am enlightened. The light has been switched on. It isn't a passing of knowledge. That's why Sikhi isn't textbook knowledge that can just be passed on from one person to another. 
And unfortunately, that's what we have with Sikhi today. We have a lot of textbook granthis, textbook gyanis, who just know everything as they've been taught. But Sikhi is not a path of knowledge being passed down. It's a path of enlightenment. When you awaken, when you are blessed with awakening, then the knowledge becomes revealed because the knowledge is already there. You are part of that. It isn't textbook knowledge that just gets written down. The Guru Granth Sahib Ji isn't a textbook. It is revelation. As the Brahmgyanis, the Sadhus, the Gurus, the Pagats, as they became enlightened, whichever knowledge came to them, they had to express it. And they expressed it in song, in word, in poetry. So it is the knowledge that is already there within you. It's already there. It's just the ones that have the light switched on, that have the ego removed, that they, they have the veil taken away from them, so what they can see is the reality of the universe. So a further understanding of Oankar, Guru Gobind Singh Ji in the Bichitar Nautic writes, Pratham kaal jab kara pasara, Oankar te srisht upara. In the beginning, when Kaal, when the primal being created the world, it brought into being Onkar. When the universe wanted to be created by the one, the one uttered the sound Onkar. Pratham Kaal Jab Kara Pasara. When the ultimate being, the primal being, the oneness, wanted to create the expansion, Onkar Te Srishtupara. By using Onkar, the world was created. So the universe that you see around you right now is this symbol. So when you say the word Ik Oankar, when you recite that the whole universe around you is the Oankar, when you open your eyes, Oankar is in front of you. This is all Oankar happening right now. All, just as all of the creation stems out of Onkar. Similarly, Shabad stems out of the sound of Onkar. So all of Gurbani is also just Onkar expressed in word. So Ikwankar, there's a reason why Bani begins with Ikwankar, because Ikwankar is the creator of everything that you see in front of you. All the Hindu scriptures the Vedas, the Shastra, the Puranas, they begin by writing the symbol Omkar. They write the Om symbol above everything before they start. And the reason is because they're saying everything that we're about to say is an explanation of Om. And similarly, the whole of Guru Granth Sahib is the explanation of Ik Omkar. Everything that you see in Bani is an explanation of what this is. It's just trying to help you understand what this thing is. The truth is the whole of Sikh philosophy, Gurmat, exists in this symbol here. It's here, it's all here. But because we need more help understanding it, the rest of Guru Granth Sahib is to help you understand this. So what is Omkar? What does Onkar mean? Onkar is the origin of the universe. Onkar is the primal origin of the universe. It isn't fair to say that Onkar is a sound. And the reason is, in order to make a sound, with any musical instrument, in order to make a sound, you need two things to clash together. If you take a drum, you need a stick and you need the skin and it has to make the sound. If you need to make a sound with a stringed instrument, you need a finger or a plot to actually strike the chord, strike the notes. So in order to make any sound, even to blow a flute, you need the flute and you need the whistler, you need some, the musician to actually make that sound. To make any sound, you need two things. 
So Omkar can't be a sound because there are no two things to create that sound. It is the root of sound itself. It is from where sound comes from. So it's not fair to say that Omkar is a sound. Omkar is only created from the one. It isn't created from two things. It isn't a word either. Om, Ong, Omkar isn't a word. It is the utterance of the one. It is the origin of word. It is the vibration that's at the root of everything. It has no source. It is the source of everything. Omkar has no source. Omkar is the source of everything. When all else is gone, in your meditation, when all the delusion has been broken, when all your attachments have been broken, when your self-identity is lost, all that will remain is the presence of the One. That presence of the One is manifest in Ik Wanka. It is the vibration that's already there. What you need to do is to lose all the noise of your self-identity to hear this sound. To experience this vibration that's already there. To feel the presence, this resonance. So it is at the point where you cannot distinguish between the wave and the ocean. Then the, o the sound that the ocean is making is Omkar. When all duality has faded, at the very height of your meditation, you will feel it within you. It's not fair to even say that you will hear it because it isn't a sound. You will know it. It will be within you and around you and everything that exists. It will be the presence of everything. It is not a sound made by an action. It is the sound which is without action. It is anhadnad. It is the vibration that has not been struck. It is the sound that has not been made. The unstruck vibration. And that's where you start seeing these terminology where people talk about anhadnad. The sound that cannot be heard. The sound that cannot be made. And again, it is Unfair to call it a sound, because it isn't sound. It is the energy of everything. It's at the root of everything. So in the Shabad that I talked about before, Ramkali, Mahala, Pahala, Dakhani, Wankar. Guru Nanak Dev Ji starts that Shabad, and he starts by saying, Ik Wankar. Satgur Prasad. Omkar Brahma Utpat. Through Omkar, Brahma was created. Remember the Trimurti. Brahma Vishnu Mahesh. Creator, sustainer, destroyer. Guru Nanak Dev Ji saying that Brahma was created by Omkar. Omkar Kiya Jinachit. And Brahma kept Omkar in his consciousness. Brahma meditated on Omkar. Omkar sal jug bhaye. From Omkar, the mountains and all the ages were created. All of creation was created. All of time was created from Omkar. Omkar ved nirmaye. From Omkar, the Vedas were created. All spiritual knowledge has been created from Omkar. Omkar Shabad Udare. Through Omkar, the Shabad, and through the Shabad of Omkar, one is saved. So you have to know what Omkar is in order to be liberated. You need to have experienced Omkar. You need to be Omkar in order to call yourself liberated. You and Omkar need to be one. Omkar Gurmukhtare. 
through Onkar, through the Guru's Mat, the Guru's instruction, one swims across. Onam Akhar Suno Bichar. Listen and reflect to the Om sound. Onam Akhar Suno Bichar. Onam. Here Bani is saying, listen to the sound. Onkar is the name of the symbol. Om, Ong is the sound that it makes. So that's why Guru Nanak Dev Ji is using both. He's saying, Onkar has done this. Onkar is the source of everything. But he's saying, listen to the sound of Ong. Onam Akhar Suno Bichar. Some people have translated Onam as being Ong Name. That that you have to surrender to. Surrender to this sound of Ong. Suno Bichar. Listen to this sound. Listen to it. Know it. And contemplate on it. Onam Akhar Tripavanasar. From this Oankar, the Trimurti is destroyed. You won't see the Trinity anymore, you'll see the One. Tripavansar means that the essence of the three worlds is contained in Onkar. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji doesn't buy into this Trimurti idea. He's saying you're missing something, you're missing the oneness that's behind it. Once you know the Onkar, the three worlds you will realize, past, present, future, heaven, hell, earth, everything that's broken up into three, you, me, and the distance between us, all of that will be broken down because you'll realize that everything is Onkar. So the Onkar will destroy the Trimurti because the Trimurti is born out of Onkar. Sun Pande, kya likho janjala? O oh, scholars, why are you writing about worldly debates? Why do you waste your times? Ke ani karna, oni karna. You have to listen to this, you have to wear this, you have to do this, you have to do that. He said, why are you talking about these things? Likharam naam gurmukh gopala. Listen to the Guru's instruction, and if you're going to write anything down, write Ram naam. Onkar is the name of Ram. Onkar is God's name. So if Guru Nanak Dev Ji is giving so much ustat, so much praise to Onkar, and if every spiritual scripture until that time began with the Om symbol, what's the need for Guru Nanak Dev Ji to even come up with a new symbol? Why not just use this one? This goes back to what we were saying about not being exclusive to anyone. It merges two traditions together, the two prevalent traditions of the time. And even till today, the two major schools of thought. You've got your three religions which are Abrahamic, Six major world religions. You've got your Christian, your Judaism, your Islam, which is the monotheistic. And then you've got your panentheistic, which is your Buddhism, your Hinduism, Sikhism. So when you read in your dictionaries, when you read anywhere that says Sikhism is a monotheistic religion, Ikonkar completely d refutes that. It's a, it's a message of unity. It's not divisive. It's not saying one is right and one is wrong. But Guru Nanak Dev Ji is making it very clear that we must not get lost in any of the, any of the thinking that breaks the world up into twos or threes. Dualistic thinking, Trinity thinking is of no use. And even in Christianity, you have a Trinity, the Holy Trinity. But Guru Nanak Dev Ji would say, well, what about the ultimate one that's inside all of them? So, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, what he's doing, what he's saying is that this is fine, the Om understanding is fine, but at the time when Guru Nanak Dev Ji was there, he's saying that the world has lost touch with the true meaning of this. You, you've lost touch with it. The fact that you allow yourselves to break yourselves up into higher and lower castes, you allow yourself to be segregated, you think of yourself as separate from other religions. He's saying you've lost touch with what the true meaning of this is. 
So Guru Nanak Dev Ji has had to reinvent it and re-clarify it. There's nothing wrong with this. This, this. this Om symbol tells you everything you need to know. But if that's not good enough, Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, well, let me give you even further clarity on what we're trying to say here. He's trying to give the complete picture here. He's trying to maintain the correct definition of Om. He's not taking it away from anyone. He's saying this is fine. But he's leasing new life into it and say, well, let's not forget that there's an ik that's more important than the three. That's even superior to all of that. It's the complete definition of, of the universe, of God, spirituality. The complete definition is in this. 